It's going to be very hot. It's going to be very uncomfortable for everybody. The bomb. You're going to slide down them big hills. You know what I mean? On the big, nice burgundy snowboard. Okay, here we go again. We are back in the booth here at the bomb hole, which is presented by Pub Beer. Now, always got to do it. First things first. Ethan. Not Stony Buds. Ethan. <laughs> How are we doing today? So good, my dog. Love to hear that. That's my left. We have Dale Rayberg in the booth. Dale, how are we doing? Fantastic. <laughs> love it. Love it. This is going to be a great episode. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Dale, he's, a, he's an icon in snowboarding. That's, that's an understatement. He paved the way in the 90s with, you know, jibbing, pioneering, good style. It's a huge part of Joyride. Uh, basically why snowboarding is cool and what it is today. A lot of that comes wow. back to Dale. Thank you. Now, um, first things first, let's talk about where you're from. God. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to say one thing first. Thank you for having me here. This is a, it's an honor to sit at the, sit in the seat, man, in the hole. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan and I, I listen and watch to all these things and I love it. So it's really cool to be here. So thank you. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm from Wisconsin, uh, Northern Wisconsin, uh, a town called Shatek, Wisconsin. Um, yeah, and uh, humble, humble beginnings. You know, small town living, um, country living, cows and and corn. Um, I was fortunate enough, at least in my mind, to not be a farmer. Although I have a lot of good farmer buddies from back then, I, and I love you guys. But I grew up on a lake, um, fishing, water skiing, and that stuff, and you know, skateboarding creeped in, and, and that, and then it started. But yeah, the the humble beginnings of Shatek, Wisconsin. Love it. Now, a lot of people don't know that, you know, there's not a lot of pros from Wisconsin, right? And you guys had your crew and it was awesome. And, and a, a, where did you grow up and who is your crew? Like where'd you grow so, up riding? Yeah. Like, so, um, Chatech, Wisconsin is, is kind of a cool location because there were actually a lot of ski resorts around within, let's, let's call it an hour and a half, you know, reach. Um, the first ski resort that I ever snowboarded at was called Christie mountain in Bruce, Wisconsin. Um, and they had a blue abominable snowman as the, and he would ski around the resort, but super small, um, you know, killer little resort. And that was where it all started. And then, uh, in the town of Rice Lake, which is maybe 14 miles, um, to my North of Chatech, uh, there was a ski resort called hard scrabble and that's where, um, cut the teeth, you know, T bars and rope toes. Then they did get it. They got a chairlift at one point. Um, but th those were the days of when it really started. And then, you know, that winter we started to explore and I, I always say we, when I talk, because I was with Roan Rogers all the time. He like grew up, I don't know. Yeah. Give Roan a, a horn, man. Um, he grew up, I don't know, like a mile down the street. So, uh, we always would go do this stuff, you know? Um, but we started to go to Trollhagen and I think we were probably the first snowboarders to ever go to Trollhagen, which for me is really interesting to see. Um, it's kind of a Mecca, I think. Yeah. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think maybe the whole entire professional snowboard group were out there at some point this year but yeah so Trollhagen was a spot and wild mountain was another spot and those were kind of the four really close resorts that we could get get to quickly and easily and uh and make it happen they were cool with letting you snowboard back then uh they were okay with it um i mean there's a precursor to it we were kind of punks we weren't really probably the most um i guess best behaved kids on the ski hills so we probably gave it a little bit of a bad name and a bad rap from the beginning anyways, which I think we were supposed to do because we were the snowboarders. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, they warmed up to us and stuff, and um, we didn't have too many issues. I think, um, you know, Hard Scrabble, the, that resort, would probably embraced us the most. But we would do stupid shit and, like, you know, go out of bounds and, and snowboard over the, the hoses that they'd make snow with. And you're like, dude, what are we doing? The you first didn't think jibs, like basically. Yeah, unintentional jibbing jibs. The jibbing yeah. the hose. Yeah. yeah. Hose jibbing, the, jibbing the hose. Hard scrabble. You guys sit around and play scrabble and it was really hard. That's <laughs> interesting. I, I, I don't quite know what hard scrabble I means. I kind of like it. I think it's pretty dope. But the, the ski resort's still there. Um, it's non-operational. So if anyone's got some bucks, you could probably go turn that thing on and make it happen. But Just get the ropes going. That's all yeah. you need. Yeah, turn those ropes on. <laughs> I want to know what the first board you were riding was. Yeah, first snowboard. That's a cool story. So first snowboard... Um, it, the lead up to it was I was a skier. I skied. Um, I was into it. And um, I was in the mall in Rice Lake. I mean, picture this mall in rural Wisconsin. And there was a, a sporting goods store that sold like baseball gloves and basketballs and shit. But then 
there was a dude sitting out in front of that store and he had a little display set up like a table, you know, folding table. And he had a TV playing the Sims movie. And I don't know what Sims movie it was, but this was like 87. So it's maybe, it's, it's maybe Terry Kidwell. I don't know. Maybe it's a Jake Burton, but I saw that and I'm like, I didn't really know about snowboarding, you know? And I saw that and I was like, I was with my dad and I'm like, dad, I want to do that. And he's, he called it shushing. He's like, that guy's shushing down the hill. Shush. <laughs> he's shushing down the hill. But I saw that, and that was kind of, that set the trigger in my mind. I'm like, that looks super cool. I was skateboarding and had that, you know, that vibe. But to see that led me to getting my first snowboard. So, you know, you get Thrasher Magazine subscription, and, and you'd see stuff in there randomly. And you'd be like, dude, this is sick. How do I get a snowboard? So happens to be that my cousin owned a, skateboard bike shop in green bay and my it was my mom's i think sister's son right so a close cousin she calls him up and saying hey steven steven pratt steven pratt he's like can you get snowboards so i got a sims switchblade 1650 from my cousin i wish i remembered the name of the shop but i don't but um that's how i got that and it was that was the beginning and, and i was hyped the Sims. Pure Juice logo but, on that? Is that the one with like the triangle and the yeah, colors? Yeah, yeah and it said, they had the wood sidewalls, like the maple yeah. vert lamb. Um, just super rad. I mean, I really had my heart set on the Terry Kidwell, though. Yeah. You know, like the, with the stripes. I wanted that. Iconic. The freestyle, I think it was called. Yeah. That wasn't available, so I got the switchblade. I was hyped on that. And that was that was the first board. And it was just, when the, you know, come home from school that day, and there's the box. And my mom didn't open it, you know. She's like, "Here, this girl." You open that box up and pull that thing out. It's just crisp, shiny, fluorescent, pink Sims on the base. It was, yeah, that was dope. Uh, another point I want to bring up too is, you know, snowboarding is so widely accepted at this point. It is in the Olympics. It is you can get a damn gold medal for it. It is as popular as skiing, and it it, it doesn't have that same counterculture. Uh, outcast kind of punk rock feel can you kind of explain the draw to it as being a skateboarder when you're a kid yeah no you're right i mean obviously snowboarding is a mainstream thing and that's cool it's, it's, I'm, I'm glad that it's gotten to that point there's a lot of great aspects to that but back in the day right it was not like that it, we were it was the rebel component um i mean skateboarding was the direct i don't know if descendant is the right word that snowboarding was a descendant from skateboarding but skateboarding is where it came from in my mind maybe maybe tom sims had some surf vibes in there but i'm giving it to skateboarding and thrasher is where you would see it there wasn't snowboard mags yet and so it was um it was that rebel inner punk vibe i mean that that was the drive and it was it was being anti-establishment it was being I, I you know i don't like to be told what to do i'm gonna go do this and i'm gonna do it my way and that was a huge component i think to you know, back then the group that I was associating with all my friends and homies, we were, that's how we were. We were like, dude, we're going to go do this. And, you know, maybe not intentionally raising hell, but raising hell along the way accidentally. Um, but just having that stance of like, we're going to do this differently. It's not, we're not skiers, you know, and then there was a huge skier hate thing then. I mean, it's probably a much more closely meshed thing. I mean, they obviously steal all of our, all of our names now, but um, <laughs> It was, it was really divided, a tremendous divide, you know, and um, it was fun to be that way. It was, it was the drive. It was cool. That's well said, too, because when the skiers are like, we don't like these snowboarders, and you're like, I'll be, the, I'll be the villain. I'll be the punk. Yeah. I'll be the guy you want me to be, you know? And Absolutely. You, and it just, it just now they call it. skiing shredding, too. I was yeah. confused at first, but they, they can have it. Yeah. They're shredding out there. I mean, I guess. <laughs> yeah. they, go, they go switch dance and fake yeah. They're shredding. They're hitting street stuff. Why not? Well, we got, we got a ton of stuff to cover, so let's just jump right from when you got your board. I want to know how you got from getting that Sims to, to being sponsored. Yeah. God, man, so got the board, right? And that was in the fall, and winter comes, and I didn't know if I could snowboard, so you go up and you do it, and you, you, know, you, you learned, right? It, super quick, steep learning curve because no, there was no, like, buddy showing you how to do it. There wasn't no certification stuff yet. It was just... Yeah, you, you can go on the chairlift. You got a leash on that thing. How's it going to stay on your feet? That kind of level. And, you know, uh, just going constantly. Every, every day after school, going snowboarding. 
every moment, every weekend, going up and doing it. And, you know, at that same time, you know, trans world snowboarding was happening. Snowboarder was happening, at least subscription wise where you could get it. And I was getting that. So you're right. You're getting the mag. You're looking at the pictures. You're seeing the dudes. You're seeing you know, Terry Kidwell, Craig Kelly, Bert Lamar, all the, the OG dudes that I was looking at and you see in their style and you see what they're doing. You're, you're kind of like, I'm, I'm trying to emulate what I'm seeing, but at the same time, it's your own style too, right? You're, you're doing this stuff and it happens. And I so happened to be able to do it. It was maybe a little bit natural and you could do a big mute grab, a slob and a method, you know, whatever tail grabs and stuff. And, um, there was a, a series, a snowboard series that winter that happened in the Midwest called the upper Midwest snowboard series. And I believe it was put on by the alt. We need to give the alt an air horn. Let's give him an air horn. Jay Erickson, the alt in Minneapolis ran this, this snowboard series with John Ba and Bruce Erickson. Those two dudes had so much to do with it, but you're snowboarding, you're learning, you're looking at the mags, there's contests happening. So we're going to do a contest. And that's where you're meeting people, people like me and Roan, Together, right? Going to these contests, you're meeting people like Nate Cole, Jeff Curtis, Joe Curtis, Jake Blattner. Like the list goes on who, who ultimately become lifelong friends. But at that point, you're in these events, you're doing stuff, and, and I happen to be winning a lot of them. I was Midwest champ, you know, and all the shit. And um, at that point, you're like, I wonder if I could get sponsored. You know, I wonder if I'm good enough. I, I, and I had really, really supportive parents. So my parents, my dad would... We would build a jump and my dad would walk up there with the point and shoot with film like back in the day and take pictures of me hitting these jumps. And then my mom had the typewriter out on the table. It's like, you need to type a letter, type a little letter, a sponsor me letter. Wasn't even videos. And I would send, I, I got some shots, printed them out, typed up the letter and I'd send a letter to Sims. You get these addresses out of, out of trans world of thrasher, send a letter off. Send a letter to Burton. Send a letter to Avalanche. And um, that first winter, I got a letter back from Burton. And they're like, we would like to sponsor you. And it was, it blew me away, right? And it was um, the rep then, this is guy Clark. And I think Clark's probably a pretty big dude in the industry these days. I think he went, to, went from Burton to Quicksilver. I'm not sure. But Clark was the rep, right, in the Midwest. But I don't think Clark had maybe the budget to sponsor people. So the sponsorship went through a guy named John Yusko out in Colorado. And John Yusko needs an air horn. John Yusko needs an air horn. So John Yusko was, was the sponsor that sponsored me and at that same time rowing um, for Burton. And we, but it, you know, and as a kid, we rode for Burton. Didn't ride That's for, crazy. <laughs> yeah, so the, that, like the end of the first winter, Burton sponsorship. You know, two, two or three snowboards, pair of boots, get a jacket pants scrapers right wax scrapers you get this was it and and then my contract that i had this was a contract they would match my winnings so you could win like i think a hundred bucks would be first place in the midwest maybe 150 bucks and you get matched so that's how it all began man and um how old are you at this point 16 7 16 17 somewhere 17 something like that and um that's how it went down. And, you know, you just kept doing the contest. And I kept winning. And, and I mean, this isn't just like a half pipe event. This is half pipe, slalom, mm. moguls. So if I won all three, I got a nice little paycheck. And then Burton would match that paycheck. And my parents were tripping out. They're like, you're actually making some money. You know, as a little kid here, you're doing this. And so that's how it happened. And um, I ended up winning a lot of those events. And uh, then there was a little, I think there was another event series in southern midwest where you'd go to like iowa and some of those places um and i think it was rocky and dean jones ran that snowboard event and from that snowboard event you could go to the nationals and the nationals was like the goal i'm gonna go to the nationals and i got invited to go to the nationals that second year with burton and uh that's kind of that's how it happened man yeah. It's incredible. I remember those old Burton scrapers. It's funny you mentioned those. Right. And we got scrapers. <laughs> like it's a big part of the sponsor package. <laughs> those were dope back yeah. then. <laughs> and it's, you know, as a kid, 
being from Wisconsin and looking at magazines and you're going, this is what I want to do. This is the only thing I want to do. It's the only thing I think about. And my mom always say, if you pay, paid half the attention in school to do the snowboarding, you might pass. Because you're just <laughs> only focusing mm-hmm. on snowboarding. And then to, you know, eventually down your career path and like the stuff actually happens and you're making a living and it's going on. It's a dream come true, man. And it, that was the very beginning. That's amazing. Now, talking about being from a small town in the Midwest, growing up riding rope toes and T-bars, you see a lot of talent that comes out of these tiny little mountains, be it in Massachusetts, be it in New Hampshire, be it in Midwest, Ontario. You know, they just foster talent. Now, can you explain, you know, why this helped your skills at a young age? I mean, the super simple, stupid answer is sheer boredom. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There isn't anything else to do other than get in trouble and be a redneck. So that was the outlet and it's the passion. And I think that still exists today in a lot of things. You know, I mean, a lot of the super successful people come from places that, that don't have a lot of uh, ability, right? You, they create it themselves and they want it so badly that they chase it versus being from somewhere where it's just, you know, always nice and always perfect and this and that. You, you just take it for granted when you're from those those kind of, I'll say suppressed, but it's not suppressed, but it's like you're from those elements of, of less, the want is way more. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why. It also seems like, uh, you know, I grew up in Massachusetts and I think if you grew up in, let's just say Salt Lake City, you be, you could go to the chairlift and you can see pros get on the lift in front of you. But when you're from Wisconsin, it seems so far out of reach. It seems like, at least in, uh, speaking from my experience, that you're, when it's actually happening, you're like, Holy shit. I didn't like, yeah. there's a board coming in the mail. What? Yeah. I mean, I remember the first time I did see a professional snowboarder, you know, and it, that's like, that's a radical moment. That's a, that's like an aha moment, you know? And you're just like, dude, it was, it was actually uh Maddie Goodman and Kevin Staub was snowboarding. And I think this guy named Jean Melton in a basin on a on a family trip and i saw those dudes those with Rowan as well and we were like dude those are pro snowboarders should we get their autographs you know like it was that that that's the difference right you, you just you're so unaccustomed to that and if you see it now it's real it's touchable it's tangible there's a dude right there that guy's in a magazine it's cool well said well we're talking about the nationals and and all that and so what what was the evolution where'd you go from there Gosh, I mean, it's the path. It's like, you know, you go to nationals. I, I ended up, it was my first airplane flight ever flew. And it, I was with a, a good buddy of mine who actually lived here and just recently passed away. But John Krieg, give him an air horn. John Krieg and myself, right? Took, I was my first airplane flight. We flew from, I don't even know, Minneapolis to Ontario, California, and got on a bus. And we went up and stayed in Green Valley. And the contest was at Snow Valley. And you meet all these people, and and I ended up doing super good in nationals. I think I got second in the half pipe. Mike Passage won. Um, I think I got second overall in the racing. I was a hard booter, right? I had I rode hard boots, ASM PJ boards, the whole thing. And um, you know, it was Chris Klug and Tad Dobson, and I think I actually had the best time at one point. But like those things were happening, and at at that same time, guess who's there? John Foster and Kevin Kinnear, right? You meet those dudes, and I'm like 16, 17 years old. And you see in Dana Nicholson and Joe Jackson and all these people who were in the magazines. And, you know, you get second place at something like that. And then the word kind of goes around. And then, you know, next contest, maybe someone's talking about you. And um, there's a couple years of that through high school, right? And you're doing nationals and you're doing good and got some pictures in Transworld from that. I think my first picture ever. And you're you're going to the summer camps at the same time. This is all happening coincidentally, like, together um and it just kind of elevates you're meeting people and it's the network thing and you're you're a kid but it's happening and um that's how it took it to that next level you know through high school you're winning so they just want everyone's yeah yeah, people are talking and you're meeting everybody yeah you're winning and you're 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 doing it and they're just like okay that's the next yeah photographers want to talk to you and yeah yeah john foster's like we want to go shoot in the pipe you go shoot in the pipe then i get a picture in the magazine it was, it was, un, that was like the most unbelievable thing ever. It's, a, it's like a 10th grader. Mm-hmm. Like, whoa, dude, I'm in this trans world. Mm-hmm. I just got my subscription. 
How's that? That's so sick. Yeah, it's cool. Now, pretty much everybody that sat in that chair has had some role of Mount Hood or Whistler or the summer camps playing yeah. a huge role in, in their life doing that. Huge role. That year-round snowboarding, sharpening their, their skills and all that. How, how did that play out for you? Yep. I mean, it's uh, I think it's part of the path. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that first back to the Sims switchblade winter, call it 87, I don't know, something like that. Um, that summer, I was fortunate enough, my parents sent me to the Camp of Champions in Whistler. So I went out to Whistler. My parents went on this big road trip while I stayed at the camp. And, um, you know, you go to that camp and it's now all those dudes are in the mags are at the half pipe, right? You're seeing them all in like John Boyer's there, Jeff Brushy's there, Don Schwartz is there. You know, the, the list goes on. So that was a huge motivator as a kid and from those like that the, that whistler camp i met lifelong friends i met russell winfield at that camp i met uh mark sullivan at that camp i met i don't know dano panagrassi people that you're still super tight with today like as kids um and it was super rad and then you know the next summer's mount hood you know i get to go to the chris carroll camp and the chris carroll camp was it was insane the people that were there right and it was I don't know if there were other snowboard camps at the same time at Mount Hood. There might have been, but that's what you knew and you did. And um, it was just mind bending. Like Josh Brownlee, who just hanging out. He, I met him there. We were sixteen. I won a pair of like OP pants or something in <laughs> in the the event at the hill that day, and I gave them to Josh because he didn't have something like that kind of stuff happens at those things. And and the um, the opportunity. Right, you're meeting these people, and you're doing these things, and you're being seen, and all these little opportunities start to percolate up. And um, you know, Mount Hood ultimately became a place that I went every single year. Gosh, man, from like nine, probably eighty-eight to ninety-eight, like every single summer, you'd be up there. You'd either be coaching at Windows or hiking around or whatever. But yeah, the the first year out of high school, from graduate high school, nineteen ninety-one. Myself and my buddy Tom Meyerhoff and Roan Rogers moved to Mount Hood. We lived in a little house in Govey. We didn't know anybody. And um, we would go up and, and kind of just poach the pipes. And we met a dude named Tom Nordwall, right? That summer, Tom Nordwall's talking, sees us riding. And, you know, we're the, the, the Midwest Burton kids. And these talks about joyride snowboards start popping going around and tom nordwall's kind of leading that conversation and he kind of hand picks he's like come here man it's me dude we're starting this company called joyride and they had some there were some prototypes floating around up there that summer and he's like we'd i think we'd like to have you maybe be on the team you know and that was insanity that was my like i didn't know what joyride was gonna be it didn't matter but the fact that someone was was going hey come here man and then saying that kind of stuff was really, really sweet. That kind of stuff happened in my hood. And I don't think I was probably the only person. I think those kind of stories maybe happened with a lot of people. You know, you'd be, you're discovered there in a way. So, yeah, that, that vibe is huge. How did Joyride then turn into you guys getting, uh, doing the hard, hungry, and the homeless? Yeah, so it was, a, it was a quick little rip right there. So let's say that was maybe june or july of night the, the summer of 91 um i remember going back home when camp was done and talking to my dad and like so I, I was running for burton and i thought i maybe had a path there and they they were treating me good and but i'm like dad but these guys said they might give me a pro model could you imagine that getting a pro model joyride snowboards that'd be so cool and so my dad would get on the phone and talk to these guys i think he'd talk to tom nordwall first and then andy shots and but right that, that next month that was I graduated high school. I'm out, right? So I did my Mount Hood thing. I'm back home for a couple of weeks to regroup and I'm going to Breckenridge, right? And so off I go with this dream of joyride maybe happening, but I'm, I'm right for Burton and it's cool and I'm meeting some of my homies out there and we're going to get a place and we're going to do the Breckenridge thing, dude, because that's what it's at, right? Transworld Magazine told me that's where the shit goes down. The sick half pipes, it looked great, right? That's what you would remember and see and kind of the worlds, right? That would ingrained into your mind and you get out to Brack 
we all move into these little places and then all these people start coming like all of our like nate cole shows up roan shows up and jake blattner shows up and there's already some people already out there that we knew but our like tight midwest posse shows up out there um, and then the joyride thing became real like they had boards and you know there was a this group of us were out there doing things differently kind of ruffling feathers without intentionally ruffling ruffling feathers showing up riding the whales early in the season there's there's joyride boards around but there's also a company called twist right who's got justin hoisneck ja right He's up and coming photographer guy the the bush brothers down in boulder so there all these things are percolating at that same time and it all just happened and i had to make the phone i, I told my dad i'm like dad I'm, I'm i'm leaving burton man what are you doing what are you doing i'm like no dude i'm doing this these guys this is real this is cool this is new it's nate and rowan myself and jake and okay man so i had to call john yusko and tell him that was that was you know as, i think i was 18 i had to make that phone call that was rough but uh it was ultimately probably the best thing because i could have just been minutia at burton right there was a lot of very good snowboarders happening at burton and they had that team and joyride was new and, and they were personable like we were they were and andy Schatz was in breckenridge he was there he was the dude that we talked to and um that's how it happened man and and that winter i guess the word the, the word got around that these Midwest kids were in there and, you know, and then Dogger shows up and it was like, and we, we cut our teeth on Mac dog movies growing up. I mean, that was, you know, that was the shit. And then he shows up and he's out there to shoot you. And that's like when stuff went, went pretty ham. It was sick. Well, yes. I saw Hard Hunger in the Homeless that year, and that's what sold me on Joyride. I mean, your guys' image it was obviously working, and uh, you guys lit that fire on the log. I was like packing my bags. I moved west. I was like, <laughs> I got, I got to get a piece of this. I got to be down. In H H H. Yeah, that was that was so dope. Thank you for doing that. Yeah, well, dude, we didn't know what we were doing. We were just doing our thing, and you know, I I, I don't want to take credit away from all the other things that were happening at that same time because Hard Hunger and Homeless has Salaz. Yeah, brush. It was a whole. Dude, it brush like, was another. Another. There's one. A, there's a whole group of people in there that were well before us, but I think we were doing something completely different, with a completely different perception. Being from the Midwest, we saw things differently, and it was, um, yeah, it was more natural to go, you know, ride the whales all day, or ride the, the ride Breck all day, or Copper do the, you know jibbing you know doing these tree lines but then coming home at night you know going out to like happy hours and trying to find free potato skins and whatever you could scounge up to eat and then going out and snowboarding at night and finding handrails and and that was kind of not i don't think people were doing that I mean, yeah nobody was doing yeah that. for the people listening to the for the layman's the whales are when the snow blowers yeah. form these kind of natural wave looking jumps and those yeah, the, were awesome. It'd be yeah. the, the early season ski resorts blowing the piles of snow before they would flatten them out into the runs, right? And they and just you, form perfect, right? Perfect jumps, yeah. And you just go up and you would do that. And that would always be in the late fall. And um, But yeah, that was kind of the time. Another thing I got to bring up too, because a lot of our listeners don't aren't that well versed in everything we're talking about too. And you got to think about snowboarding at this time. You have Burton is coming from a ski. Like Burton has like kind of some, some racing roots, you know, it's, it's not necessarily like skate influenced and your crew comes along and you guys are wearing cool gear. You guys are like hitting rails. Some of the first people to slide wooden handrails and you guys are doing board slides and front boards. And, and it's like, you know, the way it was told to me, you know, is basically, you know, you have your crews, like, you know, maybe my generation, we, they come through and change the game. And maybe that was like JP Walker and Jeremy were the guys yeah. after you, but you were the generation before them that, that took the reins and started pushing, you know, street snowboarding, sliding rails, just looking cool, shifty back threes, switch, like poking out your grabs instead of just doing the trick. You guys were throwing some flavor on the tricks too. Yeah. That was going down. And, um, you know, the, the group of us in Breck at that time, there was some simultaneous stuff, I probably said that wrong, but simultaneous. simultaneously <laughs> happening things yeah. like Tarquin. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Tarquin on that trip that I mentioned earlier, going out to a basin and seeing those pro snowboarders, I think, um, I don't know if it was the same trip, somewhere in there, but 
at a basin, I went to a PSTA event. It might've been that same trip. And it was like, you know, Adam Merriman, Andy Hetzel, Craig Kelly, Sean Palmer, all those dudes are there. But guess who stuck out in my mind the most? There was two dudes, Tarquin and Quinn Sandville. And those dudes were doing something so different than anyone. They had these super wide stances, really low high backs, baggy ass pants. They were doing everything revert, switch. But this is in, this is way before, this is like two years before that. So maybe 89, 90, maybe 90. Um, it wasn't the street stuff, but the skate vibe, right? And I think, you know, that was happening. So there were other things going on at the same time, but the but the, I think that late night street handrail stuff probably happened in Breckenridge first. Um, I mean, we could fact check that. I mean, who knows? I'm thinking so. I'm thinking that's probably yeah. what was going on. And unintentionally, just that's what we did. And and a lot of it, you guys didn't have a camera. That's why I talked to Roan, and Roan was like, yeah, we would just go hit handrails and not even bring a camera with us. Yeah, there wasn't many cameras. Yeah. It was more just out of the pure passion, the fire of, you know, keeping your boots on all day. <laughs> it was it was wake up, put the boots on, you go snowboard all day, you come back, you have dinner, or you you right, you you try to find that free food, you keep your boots on, you go out at night and your boots are on and maybe it's one in the morning and the boots might come off. Maybe they don't even come off, but <laughs> that was the the goal. I got to put myself in your shoes too thinking about that because it's one thing to watch somebody slide down a handrail and now you can see somebody front side board slide a 50 stair. Everybody you've seen every trick, right? But back then you guys are just like, probably what's, what is possible? Can we slide it? Is this going to work? Like, what was the trial and error where you guys are like, well, we slid a, an eight stair. Maybe we can do a 10 stair. Like, how was that progression? <laughs> Man, that's a great question. And it's, um, I can't speak for anyone else but myself, but I don't think that we thought about it like that. Yeah. I think it was more like, um, <laughs> let's go ride some handrails and, you know, we didn't detune our boards. We had sharp edges. I mean, the, the main thing we did was cut the tips off of the snowboards. That was kind of a, the movement to get rid of the swing weight and stuff. But um, it was more like just going out and trying to find a set of handrails that you could do, that you could just get on board slide or switch board slide or front board slide and, and naturally progress to finding the bigger ones. It wasn't like, can we do bigger ones and this and that? It's like, where's look at that that's that looks sick let's try that and <laughs> and you're in breck there's only so many rails to yeah, choose from right you're, you're finding stuff yeah. you know and it's um it was cool it was a really really cool time when i look back at it it was probably one of the best times i mean we had a lot of fun now you quickly breezed over we used to cut the nose and tail off the board but i got a, I got a story from blue he's like the first time I ever met Dale, uh, I didn't even, they didn't even ask. They just took my snowboard. <laughs> they took a frying pan or a saucepan to basically use it as like a mark for the nose. And they marked it with a marker. And then they cut my nose and tail down off my board without even asking me. And so <laughs> I think probably true. Ex explain, <laughs> explain like why you guys, because you the boards weren't how you want them. So you'd modify them. Yeah. That, that's something people don't deal with today. Yeah. I mean, this is my story, right? There could be another version, but my story, how I remember this happening was, you know, snowboards, early 90s, let's, it was 91 specifically. They still had really long noses and very directional shapes. Um, you could only get like a, maybe a 19 inch stance. Um, and that was it. And, you know, Joyride came out and they made these really rad, the flower pots, right? The, the, the flower pot, like if anyone has one, I'm looking for one. The flower You're probably gonna get hit up. The flower pot was the game changer because a, it was joyride. It was cool. It was new. But b, it was kind of a a, a shitty shape. It, it was had these really really long noses, and I remember the day that Andy shot. So we lived in a place called the ghetto, which is the Edelweiss, the Breckenridge ghetto. We can talk about that later too. But we we're when I say we as a group of us, uh, there was a whole shit ton of people in the ghetto. But we had our little spot, and Andy shots came over with the first joyride flower pots and we all got our flower pots and i'm pretty sure that it was nate and roan who were like no way and and the pan came out on the deck and a sharpie and we're looking at it and it's like how are you going to get through the metal edge right and i think a hacksaw was around I, correct me if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure it was a hacksaw hacksaw through the, the metal edge and then jigsaw around that I mean, the, the, the boards hadn't even been on the snow. <laughs> the, dude, the dude gave them to us, 
Trent went back home, and within a half an hour, that shit was going down. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, I remember, it could have been the next day, but in my mind, it was the next day. We're on the hill, and Andy Schott sees us. How you like the boards, guys? <laughs> and he looks down, and it was just like, he was bummed. It was anger. <laughs> Someone spent a lot of money on that yeah. mold. <laughs> the shit was just gone. The tips were gone. The tails were gone. And, you know, the philosophy behind it was the cool part. Is like the swing weight was so big. And, you know, it was like a 165. But if you cut that down, you're really like a 153 or 155. Lots of space and lots of weight. And we're like, dude, you can get rid of that. You don't need it. You know, and at that time, it was like we weren't really riding powder. Like a powder day at Copper Mountain was like, you know, knee deep super lightweight you're hitting the crust in the bottom anyway so i was like get rid of the stuff and and make it better make it perform better and at that same time t-bolts like we were drilling through the boards you go to true value hardware and buy a little t-bolt and put them in and now you got a 21 inch stance 22 inch stance and these boards are cut down i think they even went up to like 26 as it progressed yeah <laughs> yeah i, I, d- I definitely bra- brag about how wider yeah, were who had I the widest i can definitely say that we didn't def- we definitely did not do that we that kept was it, just we people got, taking years to but, the next level but huh? tarquin and quinn sambo were, they had like some 28s up in there yeah there might have been 28 huh <laughs> yeah with the pants to go with it i mean i'm pretty <laughs> sure pants ever yeah, I'm built like a corgi, so I got super short corgi. legs and a long body. <laughs> so if my stance was that big, my knees would have buckled for sure. It wouldn't have worked for you. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked. But um, yeah, so the, the T-bolts happened. Um, the cut down happened. The night riding and the handrails was happening. Um, and it was, yeah, I think it, I, I think it changed stuff. I think it changed. Absolutely. It changed when stuff. you were T-bolting, were you getting into baseless bindings too? Not at that point. It came later. Yeah, okay. that was maybe. We'll save I think there was a, a the, there was a there was concept. Yeah, like we kind of doubt, but not at that point. It, it was, was a little still, too early. This it was, was like more seventh, just trying to get your stuff out there. You're more in the seventh year phase right now, huh? Yeah, this is seventh year. Which for the people that was a video that came out that was filmed all in Breck. Yep. I don't know if you want to talk about that. Yeah. But that so was another groundbreaking was, moment. Yep. Steve Blakely. So seventh year was being filmed. The same winter as Hard Hungry Homeless, I believe. And also as uh, the Flying Circus, which circles back to John Krieg, right? Back from Iowa. But yeah, seventh year was, um, so let's, let's, let's put this, let's frame this, right? We, we live in the ghetto. And I say we, so it's, you know, me, Nate, Jake, and a couple, Dave Hubach was in there. We, we had like a 500 foot studio that we built bunk beds in, had permanent Nintendo on the TV, and skate or die or something and then roan was living over here but in the ghetto there was an the next room over was steve blakely chris swires and a couple other dudes next room over from that was this guy tj lise and i think dave england and cody dresser were always there then downstairs there was mark sullivan um joe bogensai there was a lot of people in this like the ghetto and and that's I lost my train. Cheapest housing in Breck, I'm guessing. Cheapest, yeah, cheapest. <laughs> That's how got everyone living there. Yeah, it was definitely <laughs> affordable. Um, I forgot where I was going with this. Into seventh year. Oh yeah, okay. So next door was Steve Blakely, and Steve at that time, I think Steve rode for uh, Barfoot. He was a Barfoot rider. I I want to say Vans because Steve was a vegan, and this is in the '90s. No one knew about that, and we were like, "What are you? What? What, dude?" So he had some like a boot with no leather. And anyways, this was kind of that. I might be jumping forward a little bit, but Steve Blakely was there. Steve Blakely wanted to make a movie, and he, and he had the means to get this dope camera and film. So those sessions were happening. Um, you know, we'd go out and film with Blakely, and then you know, Dogger show up and more in the springtime. Um, Krieg was in the house. These things were all happening that same winter. Um, but seventh year came out, and it was. I mean, the, I think. We're going to have to fact check this, but the name seventh year came because we used to try to convince people that every seven years the earth would flip. And like, <laughs> I was wondering what the name of that was. About. There, there was something to do with that, man. And we would try to convince people of this stuff. And, and we had some people believe it and like put fear into them. We're like, it's the seventh year and the earth's going to flip. But that's how it all, all went down. So with you're that. in like three movies in one season. Huh? Yeah, that was a three, three movie season unintentionally. Wow. Not even try, just snowboarding just, yeah just doing what you love yeah i'd love to picture you guys like your crew your gear you got dreadlocks explain the seventh year dude the earth flips man. 
but uh, these huge pants. Uh, yeah, huge pants. <laughs> I want to I want to highlight too cuz you know, how important is a good crew? Because if you think about your guys' crew, the way you guys came up together and pushed each other, like how important was that to your arc of your career? Yeah, super important. And I just think that now we use the term crew, but that back then was just friends. Yeah. We, we grew up together. We migrated together out there. We did everything together. And I think it was like maybe powerful that we didn't even realize. You know, when we, when we all came into Breckenridge, there was already an established group of snowboarders. They were the Cobras. The Cobras. The Cobras. Nice. <laughs> Matt Schlingman, um, Zach Bingham, Adam Merriman, some of these dudes. And they were, they were the established dudes. They were, they were the ground holders. That was their territory. And we came in, we were called the East Coast Kicker Kids and the Midwest Mogul Monsters. And <laughs> there was a little bit of hate there. But we didn't do anything. We just came in doing our thing. And um, that crew, right, we ended up staying together forever. Like, we're all still homies today. And... So, yeah, the crew, I think today you can, like, pick and choose your crew and find the dudes and make sure they fit into your, your realm and you all think the same and like-minded. But back then, it was we just all came from Wisconsin, and we moved out there, and that's what we did. And it was, it's very important that it happened that way. All right, all this video talk, I think it's good to get into you-know-what, buds. Name that video part. That is absolutely correct. Name That Video Part is presented by our friends over at Icon Pass, isn't it, Buds? It is. It all starts now. Icon Pass is on sale for the 22-23 season. It's time to keep the stoke alive, seek a season of fun in the mountains, and do you across 50 of the best ski destinations in the world. The Icon Pass welcomes three new legendary destinations to its family of mountains. Chamonix in France, Sun Valley in Idaho, and Snow Basin right here in Utah. Additionally, New pass options have been added to the mix, starting at only $249 for an adult. The Icon Pass 2-day and the Icon Pass 3-day offer an a range of affordable entry points. Score the best prices on winter 22-23 and get all the early season goods. Upon purchase, buy now, ride now, with immediate spring access to three mountains and a total of 10 destinations by April 11th. Save up to $200 in child passes with the purchase of any adult pass. 2122 pass holders can claim up to $100 off and renewal discounts for 2223. And paid all forward with a payment plan as low as zero down, 0% APR. You can find more information at iconpass.com. Again, that's iconpass.com. All right. Now it's time to get into name that video part. Dale, how you feeling? Gosh, man. I feel good, but not really sure. It's been a while. I want to know your confidence level zero through ten. <laughs> oh God, I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go two. Two. That's I'm, fair. I'm, That's I'm giving myself That's a chance. Respectful. Yeah, two. Yeah, this could be big for you. This could Let's be big. This could be a big this one. Hey, you get I'm this. I want to nail it. Are gonna kind of really respect you. Yeah. I wanna, <laughs> don't get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I want to nail it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Jeff Brushy. Do I got to say the name of the video? Yeah, say the name of the video. Hard Hungry Homeless? No. It's, up in the ante? It's upping the ante. Oh, that's and it. It's, the, it's, it's, it's kind of like the intro. Yeah, yeah. I do remember that, yeah. It's, it's a mix of, it's a collage it's of people. It's a collage of people. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's Brushy kind, doing it's the a, tail slap yeah, part. The, yeah. Yeah, so I think Jimmy Scott doing a McTwist in there. Yeah. yeah you well, you know, what? we're, we're going to put like an asterisk next to that, but we're going to, are we counting I mean, yeah, because he went, he went right to up in the ante. Okay. I'm saying that's a win. All right, you got yeah, yourself a got bomb that. hole prize pack. <laughs> oh, what? What's in there, buds? That's you got sick. A, we got a mug, a hoodie, a draplin beanie. What? We got some stickers, some patches, some socks. Look at that. Yep, that's we designed by that. Draplin. Draplin did those. Where's all, that's all that you. available, buds? Available at bombhole.com. Thank you very and, much. And uh, thank you for your support, everyone who bought some merch. We love you. Now, we have uh, another opportunity to win something here with yeah, Name That do. Video Part, and this is the second song. This is not for you, Dale. This is Got for it. the listeners. And if you know what video part this is from, you comment on Instagram on Dale's photo. The first person to comment the right video part and movie uh, will get what, buds? You're going to get a prize pack from the bomb hall. That's absolutely right. Here we go. Mm -hmm. 
I don't get that one. I think I know that one. Oh yeah. Wow. Say it. We'll Good beep luck, it up. dudes. Say it. We'll beep it up. That's a. That's a. Um, that's correct. That's wow. right. That was uh, Gray Boy. Um, all oh, right, you're right. DJ Gray Boy. That's right. that wow, that's pretty good. Thank you guys for playing. All right, we got a first time situation here. Uh, we're going to get a guest question live from in the studio right. from Nate Cole, legendary right. snowboarder. Let's give let's give him an air horn. What do you got for us, Nate? I just try to think back of Dale and Rowan in Shatek, Rice Lake, Wisconsin, and thinking of them, skateboarders. This is where your status is measured really by the height of your antenna. Yeah. And, you know, if you drove across the lake to get to town. <laughs> and those guys, you know, as snowboarders and skateboarders, and uh, just to think, what was that like? You know, did you, were you guys getting heat or just, you know, that, we didn't really, you know, we would see you... Um, where we would meet up at snowboard contests, but didn't really know your scene where you yeah. were. I'm just trying to imagine it. Epic. Blows me away. Question. Great question, Nate. Yeah, that's a great question, buddy. And I got a, I got a funny answer. So yeah, um, you know, the antenna comment is is very true. So, um, you know, one of the funny things that um, that we did, and this is more Roan than me, but I was I was there. I was sitting shotgun. Roan got a CB. In his, in his car and the big deal in rice lake was the cbs man and and i'm gonna say rednecks and it's no disrespect to all those homies back there but you're rednecks and <laughs> they would drive up and down the strip right back and forth up and down the strip and they would be on their on their cbs and roan thought this was so funny that we could just put on like bad brains and just hold the cb <laughs> and just blare their channel with bad brains or whatever. It was like NWA or whatever. So we would do that at night. We'd park in a um, used car lot. So we looked like we were one of the used cars. And they would be driving by. And they would be so pissed. Like they would be going, Who, who do, where's this coming from? Who's doing this? Well, we, little did we know that they had, um, they had a way to tell where you were by how close the signal was and stuff. So they would t hone in and eventually uh, there was a night when they found us. Oh, shit. <laughs> yeah, they, they, they honed into us and they found us in the parking lot and, and we, it became a little bit of a pursuit. We threw the back, back streets of Rice Lake and they tried to do the box in. We had to drive up on the grass and get away. But yeah, that, that was real. I That's just imagine that happening every other night with you guys, yeah. especially with the CB radio. That's yeah. their world, right? And yeah. you're in it with bad brains? In it. Yeah, we were in it and it was, it was real and it was pretty radical. So, but, but that was just one of the many things that we would do. Um, up there but yeah the antenna thing honed me into that it was bitching amazing well all this talk of Roan I, I actually happen to have a guest question from none other than Roan Rogers oh, yeah. the legend here we go hey Dale Roan here thought maybe you could talk about our alive flight and almost crashing a plane over Argentina oh boy alright sick yeah Roan much love dude hyped to hear your voice it's been a minute that's a radical question. Um, should I just get into it? Yeah. yeah. Tell the story. Yeah. So, oh God, um, this would be 95, maybe somewhere in there. I'm going to guess. I'm going to say 95, 96, 95. Um, but yeah, there was a, um, a photo shoot that was supposed to happen in Argentina and it was going to be a Capel photo shoot. So at that time, the Capel team was myself uh, Chris Swires, Roan Rogers, and Nate Cole. And we were all to meet um, meet down in, uh, in Chile, and then we were going to take the flight over to um, Mendoza and then drive to Las Lanias and go do this photo shoot. So um, we all meet in, uh, in Chile at the airport. Randomly, Jack Coglin's there. He's the team manager. Um, everyone shows up. Um, I have my girlfriend at the time with me. We'd just flown in from Costa Rica. Um, she's not my wife, by the way. And we're all in the airport. And yeah. Yeah, Maureen. And um, we get on the plane and we got to do the, the Andes loop, right? So you take off, you circle, you get to the height of the Andes. You just buzz the top of the Andes and then it's the desert and you come down and you land in Mendoza, right? Wine City. We're like, woo, we're going to Mendoza. We're going to go to Los Lanes and do all this. And 
we take off in the airplane and it's like low pressure gray kind of rainy doing these big giant loops and get up high enough and you see on the other side of the Andes, like it's just right there. There's razor edges. You're looking over and it's just bluebird, crystal clear desert. And we come over the top of the mountain. Dude, we hit the most radical turbulence ever known to man. In my, from my perspective, the most radical shit an airplane could probably take without exploding. So we, we hit this stuff. And it's, I think maybe Rowan's next to me and Nate and Maureen and Jack's across the aisle and, uh, my buddy Chris is in the back, Chris Sweet Swires, and and the plane just starts going haywire, like radical, just ah, ta. Ah. And um, I'm pretty sure the running lights ripped out, like they just flew out of the ceilings. The the chick, the the stewardess was with the coffee cart, like slammed against the ceiling, and the coffee cart slams down on her leg, and she's like, "Oh my god, my leg!" She sits down next to Jack and like, this is going on for, it felt like a couple minutes of sheer terror, right? There's people hail marrying and I'm looking at this stewardess. I'm like, is this normal? She's like, no. And it's like death. And like, I remember at one point the wings were just bending, just ah, this plane is just shaking. It is sheer terror looking down at the ground. There's, you can't see anything but death. And I remember Chris Swires, his dad was a pilot, like a, a major pilot, right? And Chris comes up, and he's like, dude, he should have pulled back on the throttle. And like he had the full analogy of what was supposed to happen that didn't <laughs> <Sweeze>. happen. <laughs> yeah, Sweeze is breaking it down. And the shit that he's saying isn't happening. And the plane's like, go, we're like, like this, you know, just nose diving into the ground. And, and we're, and the guy's like, over the speakers, prepare for emergency landing and oh no, like hang on, and it was terrifying, dude. Absolutely, I think um, Nate always tells a funny story that I was doing like a hail mary bless. I don't even know what I was saying, but some crazy shit because it was over in my mind. I was dead. We were all done. This is it. We're done. We're dying in Mendoza, and we we pull out of it. And as we're coming into the runway, you see fire trucks and ambulances come into the airport. And like, we're like, dude. And then, then Sweeze says, this isn't good. I'm like, what's up? He's like, if the hydraulics broke, the wheels won't come down. And we're all just like, dude, <laughs> what, what if the wheels don't come down? And so now you're sheer terror of that. And we, we, we landed and it was like emergency evacuation. And I, I, I mean, my memory could be a little foggy here, but I'm pretty sure when we got out of that plane, I looked back and I think the pilots were actually like l hanging out of the pilot windows. I think they had them like slid open and they were like hanging out, freaked out. And I remember the airport shut down for the week and, and, you know, we were like traumatized sitting there. We just immediately started drinking red wine. We're like, Oh my God, dude, that was gnarly. And then, but then the, the conversation turned to we have to take that flight back <laughs> in a couple days, like a week. And then we're like, no, we're going to take the bus. And, you know, we met the, the distributor from, from ride at that time or something. He, had, he came down and he's like, boys, you don't want to go on the bus, man. Those things, those things crash all the time. <laughs> they fly off the road. Like it's real. So it was, um, it was very traumatic and it was actually something that, that uh, I still carry with myself today flying and, it was very hard to overcome. My wife more so. She's just terror on airplanes because of that. But we made it. But it was, uh, I think that was a very bonding moment for the group of us. And just the fact that we went through that shit was insanity. And we almost lost the whole Capel team. It was over. Wow. I think it was really close. That's why to like over. bands can't fly together and all that. It, so the, a funny fact is that it was the same flight that that soccer team it's same flight. The same flight that they went down on the they alive, went down the on a live. Same they had flight. To eat, eat that is true. And and another true fact is that from a, a Los Lanius, where we were, we would did this big hikes up. You could look the backside and see the wings of that plane still back there. Wow, that's that's a fact. Yeah, that that's, was the same. That's an amazing story. That's I would be scared to fly it was, too. It was gripping. Yeah. 
We're going to get into some, a Patreon question. Chris, you want to talk about Patreon for a sec? Yeah, Patreon is basically our, our family that supports us. We have our sponsors that support us, so thank you guys. We have people that buy merch, and then we have our Patreon. And uh, you sign up for it. One of the cool things, you get to get ask a question on air just like this one. Who's it from, bud? This is from Matt Ill. And uh, I think it's timely for where our conversations at will lead into this new conversation. I have a two-part question. One, can you explain how the transition from Joyride to Ride happened? And two, can you give a play-by-play -play of the iconic Trevor Graves photo of the fork through your tongue? <laughs> cool. Um, so transition. The transition from Joyride to Ride was, um, it was pretty quick and abrupt. Um, Joyride, uh, in my mind, at that it was like a year, right? 91, 92, you know, the shit went good. The, you know, product was going. We were in movies, this whole group, this team. And the, but it was really hard for them to function, I think. Like, they didn't, they couldn't really pay a lot of people. Um, at, at, there wasn't really um, a huge immediate future financially. And at that point, you're like, hey, we're in Mac Dog movies. I'm, I'm doing this stuff. And I feel like maybe I should get something or be somewhere. And right at that same time, this this conversation of ride snowboards um, happened um, via Russell Winfield and and he's like, dude, Jason Ford came from Burton, and Tim Pogue and staff from Burton are here and we're doing this and you know Blattner's gonna come in da da so um, it was super intriguing and to know that they had there was a financial backing there um, and there was you know a potential future um, so that that shift from Joyride to Ride was super quick. And it pissed a lot of people off on the Joyride side. A, the name was a huge issue. Mm, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, like Joyride and Ride, that was a giant problem for some people. Um, and then the fact that Ride took a, a big chunk of the Joyride team over, because Roan came at that time to Ride as well. I don't know if you guys know that. Roan rode for, for Ride for a minute in the very beginning before Type A started. Um, so it was quick, abrupt, and ruffled some feathers. But... Uh, it ended up working out in my benefit. I was stoked that I did that. Yeah, you were part of a good movement there. And how about the iconic photo that I remember seeing this photo everywhere. And yeah. as a now I'm a photographer. I mean, I remember seeing that just being blown away. Explain yeah. what it is to people we'll, that don't. Let's pop it up because well, Trevor actually listen, if sent this listening. one. But it's uh, yeah for the listeners, it's uh, what a dartboard with your face with some really insane lighting shot by Tra Trevor Graves, which really brings uh, some vibe to it, and the fork is going right through your tongue. Yep, that happened. And Ride put that everywhere. It was on the vans. It was on the ads. It was just their full marketing campaign, and it was incredible. Did it really go through your tongue? Yes. Oh, really? I, but, thought, I had to figure that was fake. Yeah, it did, but um, we, we cut off, you know, three of them so one went through and then the little stubs actually we just went into the skin but ah, uh, gotcha but step by step i mean it was um we were at island lake lodge for a, a ride photo shoot and um you know we're down drinking it's late in the night late in the e evening and trevor's like hey dale i got a um i got an i and i had a dream he's like i had a dream and i, I had this idea and I, I, it's a it's a little weird but i want to run it past you to see if you're into it so you know, at that time I had, you know, a tongue ring and septum rings. and It was, I had done that pat in the path that, so I had that vibe and he's, and he, he's like, come on, come through. So we, this was Island Lake Lodge pre where it is now. It was just like a couple bunk rooms and stuff upstairs and, you know, dimly lit and he pulls out this dartboard and it has, you know, a half circle cut out of the dartboard. And he's like, okay, here's the idea. You're going to put your, put the dartboard around your chin and then, you're going to put your tongue out and I'm going to stick a fork through your piercing. And I'm like, you know, I'm kind of like, sh show me the fork. So he shows me the fork and it's like I said, just like ding, ding, ding. And he's like, then I'm going to light it. And then Trevor had this camera he called the Misty Cam, which was, I think it's something that he, he made. It was like a homemade camera with some weird focal point and blurry soft lens edges, whatever. But so he's like, I'm going to shoot it with the Misty Cam and, um, We'll, we'll light it super weird and so i'm like i'm in dude let's do this and he's like he was stoked that i was you know willing to do this shot and we set it up we were in a bunk bed in island lake lodge and it had the little light like if you're laying in a bunk bed there's usually a little light right above your head um little light and he like wraps a bunch of aluminum foil around the light and like gets it all right and you know he has a polaroid set up first so you can he can shoot it and polaroid it and he's like dude look at this and it was it it was that shot, you know? And he's like, okay, let's shoot it. And I'm sitting there with this dart. I'm holding a dartboard that's on my face 
and my tongue is punctured it's it into the dartboard right uh, <laughs> literally like that and he's and i'm like hurry up and he got the shot and um it was a radical image right it was kind of very forward at that time um i don't think tongue piercings were that accepted or even normal by any means then but um the crazier part of the story is that you know ride pay, that was ride's shot because they paid it's a, it's a paid photo shoots that's ride's time ride's money ride shots and how the story goes is that trevor somehow had gotten that image in front of sony and this is the year sony playstation was coming out and the picture went up through the hierarchy of sony and it was going to become the first box cover of sony playstation that's what the image was going to be and it got, it got to the highest level and it got shut down but in order for trevor to pursue that path he had to recreate the image because the original image was ride shot ah. so i flew up to san francisco and we recreated that shot in a hotel room and he took redid it for sony and it didn't make it. And I think there's, I think it was actually going to be on, it might've been snowboarder mag cover was it was a talk for a cover. And, um, there was just threats of abandonment. If, if that picture is on the cover of a magazine, those magazines will never be on the shelves. So I think it got denied there too, but wow. I can't yeah. believe he had a dream. Yeah. What a G. Yeah, he's a G, dude. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, uh, he's talking to him, big too. Old air horn. Yeah, big old Yeah, air horn. Trevor, boom. Talking to him, getting the photos. He's down to come on the show, so I'm interested to uh, hear some of his stories. But, he wow, is, having a dream. He's got a million stories, I'm sure. Man. Yeah. We got another Trevor Graves photo as well, right? Yeah, we do. We have. Uh, you said it was one of your favorite photos. Yeah. You're doing boned out bonk on a tree. Yep. We're going to have those available, signed by Dale. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait. That's a sick, a sick shot. Uh, shot at Tyrell Basin. So uh, back dope. in Wisconsin, we did a little ride trip back there. And um, that there's a funny story to that picture because it was kind of a funny contest between me and Jason Ford. It was a challenge of who could bonk the tree the highest. And there's comparable images. And it's, it's really hard to tell of who went higher, but they're, they're both incredible shots that Trevor shot. And um, it was a super great moment in time to have captured a, a kind of a generation, you know. Mm -hmm. Such a sick photo. Yeah, the jeans and the striped shirt and the whole deals. Yeah, and people just can't bone the leg out like that anymore, it seems. Yeah, you shouldn't. Your Rav's, ankles will be like mine. Rav's <laughs> trying nowadays, though. He has to loosen up the buckles and mm -hmm. try to make it happen. Yeah, you just got to break your ankles a few times. <laughs> That's the move. You can yeah, you guys had a lot of different boots Softer going boots, on. Yeah. yeah, low top air walks with neoprene liners. <laughs> yeah. And just nothing. And it's affected the ankles, huh? Oh, it, yeah. <laughs> at my ripe age, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, feeling the, I'm feeling the air walk low tops for sure. <laughs> Well, talking about ride earlier, uh, you were mentioning the fact that, like, when you get on there, you kind of had almost unlimited travel budget. Where you're like, oh, I want to, they, like, they had a travel agent that worked for ride, right? Yeah, it was nuts. Yeah, so you want me just to talk about the the entrance of the ride? Yeah, let's talk about ride. Let's get into it, yeah. Yeah, so ride ride came out of nowhere and started, and, um, you know, it was a, a really good group of people. Um, and I think, again, it ruffled some feathers in the industry. There was a lot of hate, because it's easy to hate right? It's, it's, it's easier to hate on new cool than it is to embrace, right? Especially when it's competitive. So, um, you know, ride came out and then, and I would say out of the gate, they didn't do a lot of things good. I mean, the, the, the very first graphics were awful spark plugs and chili peppers and this crazy shit. And the, the shapes weren't even that good. It wasn't, it wasn't the flower pot, you know, it wasn't even close. Um, but they brought in a good team, um, you know, Jason, myself, Jake, Russell, Rowan originally, Cersei, Mike Kildevald on the racing side, and they listened to us. Um, you know, they showed us that stuff, and we were like, absolutely no way. I think, I think they even ran a few ads with the chili peppers and that shit. A couple squeaked, squeaked by before the e-brake hit. But um, they came at it in a really good way, and Tim knew you know, what he was doing coming from the Burton side of things, he knew kind of the, the recipe to make it work. And I think, you know, borrowing some of the concepts from skateboarding with the team component. I mean, you know, you had the original Burton team, which was like the God team. It's Craig, Jason Ford, Jeff Brushy, Mike Jacoby, Keith Wallace, right? Like the original. Um, so this would be like the next team. You know what I mean? Like it, there wasn't really that team aspect. I mean, Sims had 
Palmer and Slaz and stuff, but it wasn't, pr- it wasn't marketed like a team in that way. So they had a good idea on how to do that and, and kind of raise the bar. Um, and I think, you know, Tim being from the marketing side of things knew that you kind of had to put some money in there before you made some money. So there was, they threw it down and they, they had our backs and I mean, they had our backs to a point that probably could have maybe been their demise. I mean, letting us go wild and going to Japan and destroying stuff and getting kicked out of Japan as an entire company. Like you guys are out of <laughs> that here. That happened? That happened. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like straight up middle of the trade show after like a two week craziest tour ever to just debauchery exploding the hotel. I mean, to the ninth degree waking up in the morning the whole entire team's gone you're out with with him with everybody and not out of the hotel out of the country out of the country on the airplane <laughs> first flight out you guys are out yeah here <laughs> so it was you guys yeah to leave japan <laughs> but uh, let me tell you something man i bet you a million bucks if i could see the books from that next booking year they probably sold way more stuff than they thought they were going to sell because of that stuff was going down yeah the legend there was a lot of that happening yeah. so they had it going on and and supported the team it was cool. And that was it. also the rock star lifestyle. Just kind of like, like the Forum 8 before that, the Forum 8. Yeah, that's something that you, 100%, you went there. There's yeah. no social media. You, you came there, you blew the doors off of it, and they're like, holy, those pros are nuts. right? Yeah, that's- thank God there was no social media. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that would not have been okay. Mm-hmm. I might have had a lot more followers today, woohoo, but <laughs> thank God that stuff did not exist back then. Yeah, mm-hmm. everyone with cameras filming you guys. Yeah, we might be in jail still. <laughs> I have another Patreon question along the lines of what we're talking and this one is from uh, Christian Pitchler. Dale, what's the story behind the two different graphics and insert patterns on your first pro model with Ride Snowboards? Yeah, cool. That's a good one. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong, but the first pro model was the uh, Kira or whatever, the, the, the Jap- Japanese animation board, right? Yeah, I think with so. The, the, the running man. And um, that was still 4 by 4 pattern, I believe. And that winter when that came out, the horseshoe binding was... Um, being conceived, tested, and ready for launch. Which is the baseless, right? The baseless death binding. That's what happened. And I think, so, you know, the original release came out, they pre-book it in, you sell it in, and then you do a holiday release, which was the dancer's graphic, which was like my, my reggae vibes graphic. And that had probably the new horseshoe binding pattern on it, and it went that way. Uh, so that was the reason. Yeah, out of well, my control. Yeah, one more Patreon question from Eric Langman. Were you a part of the baseless binding movement? And what was the reason for baseless binders? Why didn't they last? I was 100% part of the baseless binding movement. Um, I'm sure within the industry, there was other people with the same thought process happening. Again, right? Things happening other places that you didn't know were happening. But in my world, we, and I say we as like Dave Hubach, Jake Blattner, and a bunch of us would talk about, you know, imagine having a baseless binding. Like the flex, the board would like, we're, we're, you know, stony baloney talk. Like, dude, it's going to bend better. You're closer to the ground. You can feel the snow. It's going to be killer. And it's different, new and da, da, da. So the, the concept started. I remember, I think it was Dave and Jake. Ray, ma- they made prototype bindings, brought them to Ride. Ride took it and eva- advanced some of the components of the sliding thing. And they put the, the damn bike screw down. What are they called? Quick clip, quick release mm-hmm. bike yep. freaking hubs. And they and they there wasn't a lot of testing that went down, dude. I mean, very little. I think there's a there's some shots of Jason Ford that circulate around where he's snowboarding. He's got duct tape over this binding, so you can't see it. But other than that, there probably wasn't a ton of testing. And it came out, and it was um it was a disaster in my mind. I think it was an absolute <laughs> disaster. And I'm surprised that more people didn't get incredibly hurt. The because first, of that bike clip? That bike. The first time I, I brought, it might have been the first time I rode them, but it was a trip to New Zealand and it was a big photo shoot and we had to ride those things. We wanted to. I mean, it was our, it was the jam, but we weren't down with the bike clip thing, right? You just could never, you couldn't get that. So I'd put grip tape, like skateboard grip tape down first, put the binding down, tighten those things down. They had rubber bushings. Like you tighten it down as hard as you can, you clip it down and sure as shit, dude, the, it was like this big front side down the line hip. You know, going full speed in that thing, and I just go in the air, and my feet just go, oh, no. just wide open, and land like that. And I just remember looking at Jack Coggins, our team manager, I'm just like, this sucks. This is, 
this is the worst thing ever. And just being so angry that A, you almost just exploded my entire bottom half of my body. But I'm like, dude, we're going to sell this. This is crazy. But they did it. They put it out there. And I mean, it was a thing. So that's the story. Thank God they don't exist today. Yeah, at the same time, the other people who are doing it was Tech Nine in my career. There you go. <laughs> Did you guys have any exploded knees and hips? No, that's probably why ours maybe pushed through and lasted a little bit longer. You actually had a bolt you could screw yeah. down. <laughs> Tarquin was like making them himself, and then we uh, started doing it from there, like right at the same time. Amazing. But we didn't have that bike clip. Yeah, so. you're smart. Could well, you we had a T bolt. Can you feel the the board better? I'm well, here's curious. the thing: is at first, dude, it was a trip. People were loving it. But then it's like the foot pain kind yeah, of Yeah, a lot crazy. of foot pain. If you're traversing like you can really you can feel too much. Like you can really oh, feel got it. it. Yeah, yeah, the bumps. It you hurt. can just feel everything. Yeah, I, I had um when you're young it didn't hurt, I guess. And then as some people you ride more Oh, it hurt. Yeah, it hurt. It hurt. That's, Especially when that's you had, why it went away. You had low top boots with you know, two mil neoprene liners. Yeah. And you're feeling the shit. <laughs> I would put some kind of like rubber padding, almost like a surfboard pad in there. Yeah. So you just completely killed the you concept killed the whole concept exactly <laughs> but it, yeah. it's the only way you could do it because it was just it would awful. just hurt you felt yeah, everything terrible everything under the foot yep but for a hot second it was dope yeah hey it was new shit yeah so dale we heard you had a dog sal and there's some good stories around that what you got for us yeah sal the dog man rest in peace my little buddy um you know there's there's many sal the dog stories but there's one in particular that was pretty radical that um, I think is fun to share. And I think people might think it's pretty good too. Is it, um, you know, first of all, Sal, the dog was born in Breckenridge in the ghetto and it was Russell's dog. Russell's Russell got the dog for me and Russell. It's like, Dale, look what I, I came back from a trip somewhere. He's like, look what I got. He picks this puppy up. I'm like, what's that? He's like, that's Sal. He's our dog. <laughs> He's like, our dog. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> cool, man. So anyways, that happened and you know, Sal, the dog went on to do his thing, but as Sal got older, um, you know, I was traveling and when I would travel, I had Sal, I would have friends watch the dog and, you know, usually close friends and good, good peeps. No one's going to do anything bad and whatever. So this particular story starts, at, I had a trip to Japan and uh, a friend of mine, I'm going to use names, a friend of mine, Dave England, he's like, hey, I'll watch the dog, man. He lived in Olympic Valley, right? In Squaw, Squaw Valley, it's a Palisades now, but Squaw Valley to me. Um, he's like, I'll watch the dog while you're gone. Oh, cool. Okay. So off I go. And I, I remember, um, God, how does it go? He, I came back from, from the trip and there was an incident that had went down when I was there. And what, what happened is that Dave and his girlfriend were walking Sal and Sal, you know, the, the leash dropped out of their hand and Sal liked to chase skateboards. So anything that slid on the ground or moved on the ground, he just wanted to go. Rrr, rrr, just, well, they were right next to the cross country ski trail. And so it happened to be there's like a an eight year old girl cross country skiing with her mom, and Sal went and went to the feet and was biting at the feet. And anyways, that innocent thing turned into a vicious pit bull attack in Olympic Valley, and I'm pretty sure that the the girl who who that happened to was um, maybe from uh, some of the some of the very higher up people of that area at that time. So that got elevated to um, you know to court trial court trial all this stuff but the dog needed to be quarantined so the dogs the dog sal is in squaw valley impound right and at this same time i have my girlfriend flying from europe over to see me for the first time ever like coming to america and like i'm you know the dog's here all this stuff's going on. I got a girlfriend coming over. I think I even I actually had a broken arm at that time. Me and Rocket Reeves collided up at Squaw Valley. So I had a broken ass arm. Chick coming over, dog in the pound. And we would go see the dog. And he didn't look at like they didn't feed him and whatever. And court trial coming up. And um, story goes, like, my girlfriend at the time, it's time to go back home. So I drive. I get a rental car because my car got broken into. All this stuff happened at one time. Car's broken into, rental car, drive to San Francisco to take her back. I'm down there for two days. I come back to Tahoe and I pull into, um, you know, Ride had a, a condo in Alpine Valley. That me and Rocket Reeves and Cersei Wallace and Tamascan and some other people lived at. And there's sheriffs there just sitting at the door. And I'm, I get out of the car. I'm like, are you Dale Rayburg? Yep. Yeah. We need to have a talk. I'm like, oh, God. 
go inside and they sit down they're like what do you know about your dog i'm like yeah i know he's in jail and he's supposed to be put to death on monday this was like a thursday he's, he got court sentenced to death and i'm like yeah he's and they're like well we have an incident where have you been and i'm like i've been this whole question like tip toe toe dude and as they're asking these questions i start thinking i'm like dude what's going on here they're like yeah well um your dog's gone I'm like, what do you mean my dog's gone? <laughs> you got broken out. <laughs> what do you mean my dog's gone? And they're like, yeah, there's, um, <clears throat> you know, some, some, somebody, we thought it was you, somebody's broken into the kennel and your dog's gone. So I'm, I'm sharp enough, dude, that at that point I flipped the script on these dudes. I'm like, wait a minute. You're telling me my dog's gone? My dog's gone? You're supposed to be watching? I'm, me, I have a problem now. I'm like, I was going to come and say my goodbye and like playing that whole script. Anyways, they're like, okay, I, I have receipts that I've been in San Francisco, so I'm off the hook. And I don't know shit about what has happened. But I'm starting to think, dude. I'm like, dude, what's going on here, man? So <laughs> those dudes go, and all of a sudden the phone rings, and, dude, I'm getting, I'm getting the stories. So what had happened, while I was gone, a couple of my good buddies that lived in Tahoe at that time, who had been visiting the dog, were filming inside of the the shelter, right? They're filming the windows, filming the locks, filming everything. They're telling the people, we're filming the dog. This is last. Minute. Well, they're figuring out how to break into this place. <laughs> <laughs> so Sal, the dog was, there was the normal kennel. And then there was the quarantine kennel, which was the separate room where there was two kennels and a little window. And they freaking went in there, dude. They taped the duct tape, the window broke the window, climbed in, let all the dogs out of the kennel. <laughs> they put Sal the dog in a burlap bag, threw him out the window, put him in the car, and drove him to San Diego in the same day. And at the same time, you know, this is back in the day, pre-cell phone. Pre they had um, a police scanner, and they recorded the whole two days. And I have that tape today. Wow. Of, and they're like, it is unbelievable. He, the dog was on the cover of the Truckee Times, like, <laughs> breakout, death row, pit bull, sense of death is on the loose. And it was nuts, dude. <laughs> Sally outlaw. And then I found out the whole, all my homies told me what happened and they had my back. They're like, dude, we had to do that. And they did it and they did it right. They just let every dog out. <laughs> that is so cool they did yeah, that. Yeah, it was good. Dude, dude that those is, boys are big yeah. old and, and That's boys. huge. Right yep. There. And, it sounds and, like a great movie. Yeah, movie it could story. It could be, man. And Sal ended up living to be 16 years old. Dude. Really? That was, he was probably about five then. So You must have been so stoked. Did you have to not have him as your dog because of the heat? I, I didn't have him as my dog for the rest of that winter. I, I knew where he was at in San Diego. He was at a good friend of mine's house. Yeah. And I went and. You know, winter was over, went back down, got him. Reunited. Reunited. But the, the craziest shit is, you know, I ended up moving up to Seattle and living in, the, in that area for years. And then I moved back to California in 2000. And Sal the dog's still there. And like, I, you know, this is like uh, uh, past my snowboarding career. I'm working in the industry. And the first day back in Southern California, the freaking mailman, come, we had an office, comes in the door. And he gets attacked by oh. Sal the dog. <laughs> Sal the dog Sal. took down the mailman within 24 hours of being in California. And I was like, I was almost vomiting sick because I thought that that stuff would be on my record. Oh wow! You know what I mean? Like I thought It'd that they would put it all to together you. and come back and get me, but it didn't. It was like past this the 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 time or whatever. Yeah, yeah. True Dude. story, man. Sal the dog. Yep. Funny so stuff. What a legend. Yeah, what a legend. Yeah, he well, was a legend. I think it's time to get into, uh, let's talk about pub beer, buds. Let's do it. You going to crack it's, one of those coldies? It's that time, huh? Yeah. Let's do it. Pub beer, their You're motto is what? Cheap, fun beer. How is that? It's, pub beer? it's cheap, it's delicious, and it's fun. Cheers. Cheers, brother. These guys are uh, cracking some can. Uh, if you're thinking about going out and having uh, one or two, or maybe drinking 95 and blacking out uh, responsibly. <laughs> Whatever it takes, what are as long as choose? it's responsible. We're going to choose pub beer every that's time. A, that's the way to do it. Now, let's get into it. Here we go. Welcome to the pub beer crab shoot. Oh All right, you roll those dice, and uh, we'll tell you what you got to do. All right, here we go. Coon Gears is six. If you hit it, four. It's a four, baby. Four, what is one of your worst fails of your career? Oh, man. Worst bail. 
<laughs> this is good. I, I got it. It's easy. <laughs> this is easy. This is the one injury that like actually affected me. Yeah. No, I went back home to Wisconsin at Christmas time just to go back and see the family and hooked up my, with my buddy Chad Schnacky. Right? Give Chad a horn, dude. The Schnack. So me and me and Schnack go to our the the original uh, Christy Mountain Ski Resort where I started snowboarding. And it's nighttime and you know twenty below zero mid Midwest night at Christmas time. And me and Chad are taking hot laps. And I remember we had a couple beers. We're cruising, and you know the place is like four hundred vertical feet. So I remember I just do a little half cab into the run, I just carve down switch, and it's T bar. Come into the T bar zone. I just went real quickly to flip back to you know to front and catch my toe edge. And just explode myself at the at the T bar and, <laughs> and exploded <Fly> <laughs> my collarbone no. so badly, man, so badly, dude. It just was like poking through stuff, and I'm just like, oh my god, dude. And that led to I still have the metal plate and I think 13 screws in there, but that's one that will never never be forgotten. But and it's funny because it's not even that bad. It was just so yeah, stupid. It's dumb. how it always goes. It's how it always goes. Yeah. It's just, You're fine on the gnarly stuff. Yeah. Like jump some huge yeah. jump, hit some crazy rail, and then do a little 180 at the T-bar. Yeah. And that, you're done. That not impressive. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes. Well, let's let's stay on track with where you're at with ride stuff because, you know, it, we were talking about this before. Um, you know, somebody was saying, like, always talking about the glory days. But, um, you know, I was kind of thinking about our, our generation, you know, people snowboard – are like, dude, Travis Race is 39 years old and he's still pro. And it seemed like in the, the, the 90s, it was like you start getting around 24, 25. It was like, whew. Yeah. You're getting old. I think you're true. I mean, um, at that time, uh, you know, I think I stopped snowboarding professionally in 1998. I think I was 28, if I'm guessing correct. Do the math. You know how old I am. But. What had happened is like you go through, you know, this young generation career, Mac Dog movies, and you're jibbing and jabbing. And then, you know, the next phase is kind of bigger picture. We're doing fun movies. And, and, and but what's the next thing? And you're going to Alaska. And I was just not stoked on that trip at all. I was just, you know, I had Mike Ranquit, you know, being my chaperone up there, which is like permanently, permanently fear and, and, and whatever. So, you know, at 28 and where the industry was at that time, it was really weird. I think it was kind of in a, a funk and ride at that time was, was, I think they brought brushy in and, and some of us were going away. And so my contract ended at 28 and I just remember having a very clear thought going, you know, I, I, I could grovel and go get sponsored and probably continue this, this path. But I feel like, like then I'm the beggar. I didn't, it wasn't like at 28, I had every sponsor lined up to sponsor Dale Rayberg, right? It was different. So I was like, dude, I need to figure out what I'm going to do with my life. And maybe this is a good wake up call and how to figure it out and, and move on. But, um, yeah, I think, you know, in that late nineties time frame, um, you know, 28, you were kind of old, you know, and, and for me as a person, I'm looking at what's going on in the industry and you're seeing JP Walker and Peter line and this, this is the next level. I'm not doing that. I'm not even close to that. Those guys are next. They're pushing the package and, you know, understanding I didn't want to. Like, dude, I don't want to even try to do that shit. I'm good where I'm at. I need to figure out the next chapter. And consciously making that decision. Like, no big deal. I'm good. I'm happy. No regrets. Stoked on everything. I need to move on. And that's how it went for me. Um, some of my friends continued on and did good. And, um, you know, it's probably a struggle, but... Um, nowadays people can keep going, man. And I think it has a lot to do with, um, gosh, the fact that you can produce so much content yourself and you can become so valuable back then. It was like, if you weren't on a trip with the dude filming or the dude shooting, how are you going to get your stuff out there? How's that even going to happen? Not happening. So who knows? It's my, my theory. That makes sense. Cause now you got guys like Mikey LeBlanc and Jeremy back out there filming video parts at 47. Yeah, dude. And, and and amen to them. Dude, that's amazing. Crazy. It's yeah. insane that they, I mean, it's, it's epic that they're doing it and still able to do it and good for them. But I don't even want to. Do yeah, it. <laughs> Mike yeah. leaves on a trip today. He's going to be shooting with, with uh, Jasmine and yeah. I think Danimals yep. and uh, 
Somebody and Spenny, like mm-hmm. Rider that's of the Year. Rad. <laughs> you got Mikey LeBlanc and the 2022 yeah. Rider and it's, of the Year. And that's epic, dude. And that's, yeah. I mean, amen to them. That's killer. They can do that, and it's passion. New rules at forty over forty club, though. Like you don't have to. Maybe the all, the you're saying all banged or uh, already been done. Yeah, ABDs, already been done. They, it's like, reset. You get reset at forty. Like you, you can you, you don't can rewind a little bit. You can basically yeah. do whatever trick the spot trick open at again. any spot. I like that. If you're forty, Jeremy's up. like go to that spot when you're forty. And yeah. then tr- do a trip. See how you do. And then come talk to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think it's good that there's people who still have um, the ability to do it at the age, you know, like Mikey's at or, or Jeremy. It's, it's commandable, man. Well, and your flying thing that happened to you, I could see why you wouldn't want to be up in Alaska. To- in helicopters in the mountains. Yeah. And Ala- all I mean, the time. The Alaska's riding's scary. Like- the flying's scary. Everything's scary up yeah, there. Yeah, it's scary. That place you get out is of bed scary. and you're like, oh, is today the day? I was, I was scared. The moment I woke up, the second I went to bed, yeah. it, it was w- whether you're in a helicopter, whether you're on the mountain, whether you're watching your homies almost die, whether you're on a paddle boat in the middle of the freaking freezing cold water, the walrus is yelling at you. That shit's real. Yep. Maybe a that, bear's going to come get you yeah, too when you're out in like, the park. <laughs> and, and you know what, man? That let pe- There's people that can go do that. That's awesome. I'm not going to ever take that away from anyone, but not me. Now, I want to I want to know specifically like when the contract's done and – you know, rides done. Like, how how did you end it with ride? Was everything all good? Transitioning yeah. out. How was that experience? I mean, everything was all good because there wasn't any other option. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it wasn't the same people. Okay. So when when that when that happened, um, it wasn't the same people. I mean, I think Tim was still in there, but probably not in a position of of decision making. I don't know. I don't really yeah. know. But the person who I dealt with was some chick. I don't even know who she was and. She didn't have any problem letting me go. And it wasn't even a conversation like, hey, maybe I can come in and help internal with marketing or or product. Or That wasn't even on the topic. It was just like, your contract's done. Oh, cool. Period. So I, did, I was never angry. And, and I think some people maybe were a little bit chapped with, with how that went down. But, dude, I had the best time for so many years and I didn't have to prove anything else anymore. And I kind of didn't want to. I was like, I was ready. I'm like, dude. There's people doing shit I'm never gonna do, and I'm good. It's not gonna last forever, so it's you gotta you gotta no, make a change. Did they be still ready. have the fork image on the buses? When you yeah, yeah, that happened. That um, I think it was at SIA in Vegas, and my contract was over, and I was still at the show, and like I remember seeing the fork picture on the side of all the vans, and I was just like, that's gotta go. Yeah, I'm all. If you guys don't have any problem cutting me, then get that shit off the van because it shouldn't be a problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's and, fair. And they obliged. They did. Yeah. That's cool. So Mike Stiskel. Give that guy a horn. Mike Stiskel. Good human being. So so all right, you're transitioning out of snowboarding. You're finding you you're looking for a career in the industry. How is that uh getting that adjustment yeah. period, I guess we'll call it? Yeah, it went um it went pretty quick. I mean, I was just like, A, I didn't know anything other than snowboarding. So I didn't go to school after school. It's just what I did. I was a snowboarder for all these years and um I had uh some friends that were at Ride originally that were at, now at a different company, which was this company in Redmond, Washington, that owned Silence and Avalanche snowboards that were probably in their second or third chapter of life. And then they had Neptune wakeboards and straight line water ski ropes and all this stuff. And I'm, my, this guy, Terry DeLeo, who was from Ride, um, he was at, at that company and he brought me in and I started in the warehouse. Like, did you want a job? I started in the warehouse. And it was awesome that I started in the warehouse because I learned about part numbers. I learned about how it works. I learned about how invoicing works, <coughs> shipping. Did There's a lot of components at that level that are super important to a business. So I learned it all from the ground up and then moved up into a marketing position. And then from there, the, the, the business got consulted and then the brands got removed from that umbrella and brought down to Southern California. And I went down with that. And so it was a cool um, kind of accidental uh, avenue that has led me to where I am today. And um, gosh, I, I can easily say I, I, I probably wasn't the dude that sat down and like wrote down what I'm going to do. And this is how I'm going to do it. I just, shit just happened. And I'm cool with that. I just, it's how I roll in general. Um, just let it happen. And it usually works out. Well, let's talk about the position you're at today. Yeah. 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 So through all these years of snowboarding and, and, um, you know, I was at flow, uh, flow snowboards for a while as a marketing guy. And then flow got acquired by Nidecker, um, and Nidecker, uh, came in and took the brand and they have all these other brands. They've got this big, massive umbrella of rad brands. 
Um, and I ended up falling into a uh, sales rep position. So I'm, I'm a sales rep. I sell snowboard stuff. I sell fun. Um, and I work with a, a great group of people um, that are, it's family owned from a bunch of Swiss dudes. And uh, it's super great. And, you know, it's, um, it's a sales rep. So it could go either way real quick. <laughs> but uh, as the time stands, it's really, really good. And I enjoy it. And it's what I love to do. And um, I love retailers. I think that you know, the retailers, the backbone of, of the industry, really. I mean, we've got, you know, the bomb hole and we've got slush mag and the, the marketing side, but the, the true side, that's getting the shit to the people, it's the retailers and it's fun to work with them and become friends with them. And it helps that I have the background I have. I can come in and immediately command attention and talk the same lingo and maybe talk more lingo, but um, it's dope and I'm stoked on it and I'm going to, I'm going to do it as long as I can. And you're working with Arbor, right? I work with Nidecker. Oh, Nidecker. Yep, Sorry, I work with bad. Nidecker snowboards, flow snowboard bindings. I do burn helmets in California, and I do Hovland snow skates. I don't know why I thought Arbor. Yeah, well, Arbor's rad, too. Yeah. Those are good good people. But, yeah, but so I'm, Nidecker, well, I mean, are you with the whole crew, then, of brands? No, no, it's, um, I mean, they have the whole family, right? Yeah. I think there's nine brands under that umbrella, um, but I only work with Nidecker and flow. That's cool. Yep, yep, I, I sell those things. Now, I have to ask, is your boots on the ground, you know better than anybody, does it feel like uh, the, the snowboard industry is thriving? Is it getting bigger? Are people buying more products? Do you think it's going to get a boom from the Olympics? What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts? I think, um, I think definitely that it's, uh, it's, it's thriving. It's good. Yeah. I think um, you know maybe this pandemic has had something to play out with the reason why everyone wants to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. But the retailers are kicking ass um, you know, and continues to grow. And it's awesome. And I think that, you know, a lot of brands um, do good. There's some brands that don't do good. And if a brand doesn't do good, you can take the dollars from the brand that doesn't do good. And, but the bottom line is, um, you know, I see growth and retailers seem happy for the most part. Um, and that's important. It takes takes that group of business-minded people to make this shit work. Mm -hmm. and the retailers are so important. I mean, so many people that have sat in your seat started as shop kids. and Yeah. It, uh, we need that. Without it, it's, you need it's it. not the same industry. It doesn't have the same culture. So yep. it's cool. You need it. And I mean, you could argue it a million different ways. You know, there's core shops. There's not core shops. There's mainstream shops. Isn't that? Bottom line is they all sell snowboards. Yeah, we need them all. And you need them. And, you know, people need to access that stuff. And I'd rather see it go through a retailer's door than an online component. Not all the time, but, you know, there's, there's also retailers that kill it online. Yeah, there's and some kids that don't have access to a shop and... What so do you think about too. Uh, direct cons direct brands that go direct to consumer or brand that go to big box retailers? What do you think about like snowboard brands going D to C? I think D to C is, is cool. I mean, um, you know, for the most part, I feel that a consumer is probably going to do their homework online or they're going to read about it somewhere. They're going to do their homework. They're going to go to a shop. They're going to try the shit on. And maybe they'll get the sale. If you got a kid that's working on the floor that's good, you can get that sale done and, and, and do it. If that consumer is only there to try on the boot because I'm going to go buy it cheaper online at home, that's going to happen no matter what. Or I'm going to go buy it from the brand at home. I don't know. But um, I think that, you know, that's, that's a reality, which no one can deny. Um, but I don't think that it's super, super imperative to retail there's definitely some brands that push it and maybe uh, prioritize it above retail. I'm not going to say any names, but you know what? They're fucking up because the retailers are very important. And if they don't get treated right, those dollars are going to go somewhere else. And that guy over here is going to feel that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's super important. I think both aspects of, of retail sales is uh, important. Yeah. Well said. Love that you're a lifer in this industry, man. It's dope. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. I don't know anything else, so. Yeah, same here. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's so funny because, like, you know, you're, like, my mom is the same way. She's like, oh, you should have gone to college. And, like, you know, if you think about the information that we know, like, I can probably tell you who backlipped a handrail in Salt Lake, like, <laughs> in 19, you know, 1995. Yeah. And, like, what stance there is. It's just useless information. Like, useless. But with this show... <laughs> Actually, like when we get to talk to you, snowboarding, we actually get to use it. Yeah, we get it. to use this. I'm like, when am I ever going to know? Like, 
what video part that you know it's amazing yeah. toy soldier create your so, destiny and, boys and, and, and hey yeah. guess what same for you you're That's like right. when am i going to be able to use this useless snowboard for you well when i'm selling damn snowboards yeah, yeah so talking like, about side cuts and camber <laughs> yeah, and know, wood cores and all that stuff Inside man all day long. Out, yeah. i'll tell you about top sheets till you turn blue in the face <laughs> <laughs> let's go guess what talk it. top sheets let's talk top sheets. uh <laughs> i forgot we have a guest question from travis wood oh, yeah. oh geez. we can't be we can't be skipping over that travis wood mr rayberg Mr. Travis Wood. <laughs> hey, uh, I want you to tell the bomb hole listeners about that time you were in Munich, Germany, oh, God. in that giant hangar with that uh, dubstep party with about 3,000 people in it and that foosball table in the middle of the dance floor. Yeah. Thank you. Travis Wood. Thank you, Travis Wood. It was very good to see you this weekend, too. Actually, yesterday. But, um, God, Travis Wood, man. He's a legend. That's an amazing question, an amazing story. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it, I'm gonna shorten it up. I'm not gonna go super detailed, but I'm gonna get to the points. So Travis and I are over in Germany in Munich for the ISPO trade show. ISPO trade show is a giant trade show that used to happen in Munich. I don't know if it still exists because of the pandemic, but it was a big deal. And it was a goddamn good time. It was it was like a giant party that business actually got done at that but you still partied at for like mega Euro style. And it was cool. So we're over there and um, there is a big party going on after the show. And it's in this like, I don't know, I want to call it an airplane hangar. It is massive. And there are thousands of people in this place, dude. And for some reason, there is a foosball table in the middle of the whole entire place. <laughs> And dude, we were, me and Travis had some skills on the foosball table, dude. And we're like, you know, we're going to go kick these, these guys' asses, man. Let's do this. And we've had a few drinks. You know, we're, we're having a good time. And we roll up, and there is like a line of people to get on this foosball table. And me and Travis, just as, as street smart as we are, we got to the front of that line immediately. Put our coins down. We're like, we're next. And these, I'm, I'm assuming they're German dudes. We're going to call them. Euro guys, big dudes are there just commanding the table with these wicked fast moves. <laughs> Looking at T Wood, I'm like, dude, we're gonna get our ass kicked, bro. It's like, let's just go. So we, we get into this game, dude, and we have money on the line. If anyone knows Travis Wood, anything is you're betting on. It. Yeah, there's money on the line with yeah. any situation. You're, going you're on. betting on whatever it is you're doing. And this this game had some hot dollars on it, dude. And we're playing, and it's like we're just getting smoked, dude, smoked. And uh, I remember Travis is the last ball, and Travis is like, this is the ball. He's like, no matter what, th whoever scores this ball wins the game. <laughs> and the dudes are like, hook, line, and sinker. They're like, okay, boys. <laughs> <laughs> of course he <laughs> would. So we, we drop in, dude, and like, I'm pass, I fucking pass it back to T. Wood, and he's like playing D, right? And he's all, he, he sets up for this just blast, and he's just like, and misses the handle and his head goes into the <laughs> corner of the foosball table, just blasts, blasts himself, like wide open gash. <laughs> Blood is going everywhere. The dudes score. We lose all the money and he's just gushing blood out of his forehead. And, he, and we're like, dude, but it was insanity. But what was even more insane is that we just continued to party that evening and somehow we end up up on the stage with the DJ and the guy's just doing his thing. And it's like, this is mellow vibe up there with thousands of people. Dude, and we're a little bit hammered at this point. And I remember like turning around and talking to T Wood and I just, I do the full on the record needle, dude. <laughs> with thousands of people. In the middle of the party. <laughs> I just elbowed the, the, the record player. And it just goes, Dude, and the whole place looks at us, and I just, I, I'm like, T-Wood, we got to get out of here, dude. And we turn around, and there was like an emergency fire door, and we just blast, we're in t-shirts, like our jackets are at the jacket check-in, because you have to do that in your, yeah, they you make check you your shit that. in. Dude, we blast through the doors, people are chasing us out, and we're running through a field in like knee-deep snow. Just, just, dude, what did we just do? <laughs> We end up getting away and all this stuff, but dude, it was it was such a funny night. I mean, it carried on. I mean, he, we get back to the hotel and Travis was doing the worm on the on the carpet coming in, and it just got ugly and dirty. He had all his money out. We lost wallets and lost jackets, but 
it was never an amazing, a dull moment with there Wood. was never a dull moment with <laughs> travis wood and it was um it was pretty funny what how it went down and we survived dude love that <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I want to pick your brain on the glory years over at Ride. And correct me if I'm wrong, I feel like it was, you're talking about teams in the, the when you have like an elite team and also that combination of how a team's marketed. It seems like it was the original Burton team and then Ride and then like Forum 8. Like yeah. those, are, was that, would you say that's kind of a correct time frame? Like I would say so, yeah. And in terms of like a brand promoting a team, yeah, I would say that's. I don't know that good. Burton had the vibe of a full team though, because there was people doing different things. Some of the guys did, like Brushy would hang with certain people. They had, um, I mean, they know, just had those, such a mix. Like those, they'd have the those late eighties the years. They would do the poster, yeah. of like the kicker, and it was all the dudes in the air, and like that kind of led to that vibe. Yeah. And they did a trampoline demo in my high school. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but in terms of like, that's pretty sick. You know, <laughs> stealing from the skateboard kind of thought process i think yep. ride might have been right there as one of the first that promoted the team yeah mm -hmm. i mean the the shirts and the ads and the cartoon ads and the it was the team and that the team's powerful i mean that goes a long way so you, you buy into the image you buy into the culture you're like i want to do that i want to be like them and back then no social media these yeah. people like yourself aren't humans they're not tangible so when you go somewhere you guys are fucking rock stars. And I was I wanted to like just kind of paint that into the picture for our listeners of like just the sheer perspective of how not just like you guys were fucking famous, you know. I got a way to paint that. Yeah. Um there was a ride house in Vale and I think the reason we never met, I was scared to talk to you, dude. Yeah. <laughs> You're Dale fucking Rayburn, man. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of knew Russell from the yeah. East, but yeah. you were there and I uh moments. I was scared, dude. You were Dale. Yeah. Reason no. I moved out west, you know, you guys crew. So sick, dude. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you look back at it and it was kind of rock starish. And I think that um God, we were so young and you're put into it, but you know, trip to Japan where when you showed up, there would be I don't know, a few thousand people waiting for you to show up. And they wanted to see you get fucked up, right? Like <laughs> they wanted to go to party. Like no matter where you went. We were going to go snowboarding, and then we're this killer party. <laughs> and it would be like a lot of people waiting to go party. So that was a pretty radical thing. And I think that um, I count my blessings that I didn't completely fucking lose path because it probably could happen real easy. But um, that was a component, you know, and like you'd go to some of the very early, you know, indoor events like the, the Gothenburg indoor event. Um, and this isn't necessarily ride team stuff, but just more me and, you know, like Nate Cole was there and Ingemar Bachman and Peter Line and Terje Hawkinson and Dave Lee. And the list goes on for the people that were there. And this is like an indoor arena. Let's call it 40,000 people, right? And you would snowboard down, you know, they, they built above the seats, with plywood, the runway in, and in the middle of the arena, maybe it was an ice skating, a hockey arena, I don't know. In the middle of that was this, you know, 15 foot high, 30 foot wide quarter pipe. And dude, it was like carte blanche stuff. Like they had, you know, all the, the, the super sexy women in the short skirts would, would walk you out and they would announce your name and 60,000 people would scream. And then, you know, you walk up and you do your run. And, but just that kind of level of magnitude, of, of, you know, shit, I'm from Wisconsin. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm in Gothenburg and there's 60,000 people screaming about me. Yeah. So trippy, mm -hmm. but real. And, you know, when the team, when the ride team traveled around, like we did a lot, it was a pretty impressive thing when we would show up somewhere, you know, whether it was in Japan or in Europe or wherever it was, New Zealand, like it was a pretty radical, uh, pretty radical thing. What kind of prize money for that Gothenburg thing? God, dude, I don't know. I think Terje won, maybe. Or I think he did, yeah. Maybe, maybe that was 20000 back yeah. then. No. But, oh. And that was the beginning of those things. Because yeah. the, I went to one in um, in Geneva, Switzerland, indoor. You know, I don't know, dude. And then the the, the Innsbruck Big Air. You know, I, I never got to do that. I was a standby guy one time. But that was like 100,000 people, maybe. I mean, it was an Olympic stadium. Wow. Filled to the gills and like Andy Hessel doing front flip. And like that, ah, get one of those fucking 
the cheering noise. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, <laughs> but like that stuff was going on. And so it wasn't, it was like the ride team was that, but so was kind of everybody else at that time who was at that level. It was, it was rad like that. Now I have to ask because you give, you take a kid from Wisconsin that's from small town. You give him a bunch of fame and attention. You give him a fucking truckload of money. How is how are you able to deal like no roadmap, right. and you're just sent on your way? Like how were you were you able to deal with that? Did the fame get you? Did you, did the boozing get up to catch up to you? Any of that stuff? You know what, man? I I just think that I was a humble human being. Yeah, I think my parents raised me to be a pretty humble dude, and I never got really caught up in a bunch of shit. I like to drink. And I, it never got so gnarly, you know, there was never an, a moment where I'm like, I got to check myself in. I never had that moment. It was just fun. Um, and, and I don't know why I didn't lose track or, or fall off and, and like fucking end up in the streets in San Diego. Cause that could have easily happen late night after a party. But, um, I think I just, I don't know, good friends and, you know, good people around supporting you and. You know, I saw a bunch of my friends kind of go sideways and here and there, so you'd, you'd know what not to do. Right? You're like, oh, I'm not going to do that. But, um, yeah, I just think being humble and, 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 it, and being very appreciative of, of the shit and going, okay, dude, this is rad what I'm doing. I don't want to fuck it up. Yeah, don't mess it up. Yeah, right? I want to keep going for a while, and I want to do more trips, and I want to keep going. Well, not everyone has that addictive personality too, where you can know when to not when you had enough beers. Or yeah, right. No, not to step to that. that. Yeah, no, <laughs> not to step to that other drug that you see people yeah. not doing well on. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Good yeah. head on the shoulders. I, guess. I think it's a good head on the shoulders. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of it contributes to how you're raised. Yeah, you family. See that, yeah. Yeah, the you know, because I think what happens to a lot of people that first fame gets them, and then that money, and then that ego and that and if you don't have good people around you then yeah you know and I, you know to, to be dead honest man i don't think i ever thought i was famous yeah i don't think i ever saw myself as that guy i was just i was very happy snowboarding super stoked to go travel the world super stoked on culture and food and and like seeing what was going on and just absorbing everything that was out there right and like that was that was my drive, so it was just, you know, just be mellow, right? Fucking, I mean, we obviously, f we fuck some shit up. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it respectfully. <laughs> Amazing. Well, let's get into Hot Takes. Yes. Uh, hot Takes is presented by Oakley. I rocked the Oakley Line Miners with the uh, Mod 5 helmet, which has actually saved, saved my dome ski. I, yeah, already... I noticed you're much clearer out there. Now yeah. that you've been wearing a helmet more. Oh, my God. I smashed my head the other day at Woodward. And With the helmet. With the helmet on. Yeah, Luckily, so, I was like, oh, I'm glad yeah. I'm wearing this. Um, that being said, uh, let's get into hot takes. First thing we like to ask is the Michael Jordan or goat of snowboarding, both male and female. Who you got? So I knew this was coming. This is, been, this is the biggest problem question I was anticipating. <laughs> and I even had the conversation at my dinner table in my family house with my kids and my wife. I had discussed this. And I've came to the conclusion. I'm saying Craig Kelly. Love it. Love that. I'm, I'm saying Craig Kelly. Today. Yeah. I'm going right there. Uh, that's amazing. I, I'm going to interrupt that for a second. We have no Craig Kelly yes. like, photo. I, I've been trying to. Yeah. I, we need. If somebody like has a great photo of Craig that we can knows where we can buy one. We can get on the you. set. There's we one of him. One. Like We need a Craig for the set. Uh, Mark that, Gallup. Mark, Mark Gallup. Gallup. Okay. We need, Mark, hit us up. We'll hit you up. We need this in here. Okay, uh, female. Who you got? Oh boy, this was a this was a longer discussion than the dudes, and and I think it's Victoria Jalous. Nice, I'm saying Victoria, and it was a battle. There was there was a couple other contenders in my mind, but just from how I saw snowboarding and women's progression and who was doing what, that chick was radical. I, I'm gonna lean into you more because not everybody knows Craig. It's before a lot of people's time. Why Craig? So this was, right, the thought process, it starts with the question, who is Michael Jordan? Yeah. Right? Because you got you to frame, you know, who I'm comparing someone to. And so, you know, he wasn't the first dude, but he was, you know, this arguably the best player of all time, took things to the next level. And, you know, I'm looking at Craig. I'm like, he wasn't the first dude, but he definitely paved the way in terms of contests, in terms of sponsorships, changing sponsorships, paving the path for so many people to kind of just take bites out of. And then when the, when the 
contest careers over, moving into the back country and educating and, and like taking all the proper steps to be the best, not just the best dude at winning everything or, you know, the, I got the best video parts. It was like, he was just the fucking best at all of it from my perspective. Well, very well explained. Now, next question. If you could go heliboarding with three people in the world, where would you go and who would you go with? Actually, not where would you go, just who would you go with? Uh, Nate, Roan, and Jake. Whew. Wow. Yeah. Blattner. Jake that, Blattner. Jake Blattner, Nate Cole, Roan Rogers. That'd yeah. be amazing. Oof. Okay. Who is the most underrated snowboarder in your opinion? Okay. I know. I'm going with Roan Rogers. And, and, and underrated just because the dude didn't want to be rated. <laughs> well, that's actually a great answer. Rowan Rogers, still my favorite snowboarder today. Grew up with the dude and hands down my favorite snowboarder ever. Uh, okay, worst trend in snowboarding. What do you got? Dude, I'm going to piss some people off. I say what I really think. You yeah, got to say it. what you think. So oh, people, we don't have this podcast for people to not say what they think. Yeah. Worst trend in snowboarding. I don't know. One foot shit, I guess. <laughs> 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 that will piss some people off. Yeah, I just think it's kind of corny. <laughs> Go skateboard. But you gotta and the honest. dudes that are doing the one foot shit can skateboard really good. So I don't know. It's just me. I'm old. I love it. You can bag on me all you want. No, I think uh, that's great. <laughs> okay, I, that's it. That's it for uh, hot takes. Now um, we should talk about your setup. Yeah, your snowboard. Cool. What yeah. are you rocking? What are you riding? So dude, I'm running a. Point to it. I'm running a um, a Nidecker Mellow, which is a kind of a directional. I'm not going to say volume shift because it ain't. It's just directional step back, little, uh, maybe a little swallowtail in there a little bit, but super deep side cut and um, it's full camber. I'm a, I'm a firm believer in camber. I've not, I will not ride broken snowboards. So I ride camber and um, I ride the new Nidecker Supermatic bindings, which come out next year, which I think is going to blow some people away. This is our little drop in binding. You step into that thing and game on. But that's my setup. Forward lean. You can do forward lean. Do you run? Do you run lean? it? Do I run it? No. How I do don't. you set up your board? I just run it straight up. No detune. Never detune. Um, I run thirty degrees on the front foot, negative fifteen on the 30. back. Thirty. Yep. Thirty negative fifteen. And, uh, that's a heavy front angle, huh? Yeah, I like that. Yeah, that's turny. Feels yeah, good on the knee too, maybe. Yeah, it's just the knees and the hips and the shit. And the yeah. Just don't work. If I'm like that, I gotta be like that. No, yeah. I, I heard your. I heard your. Uh, our, you know, you mentioned your pro camber. Uh, I heard an amazing term from a friend that rides uh, like a flat camber board. He, and he's like, everybody talks about how much they love camber on the show. He's like, I feel like I'm a victor, a victim of camber shaming. <laughs> People that ride reverse camber are being camber shamed. <laughs> camber shaming. <laughs> Do you, probably true. What are your thoughts on reverse camber? Are you a camber shamer? I'm, cam I'm a reverse camber shamer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think, hey, my first snowboard was reverse camber. And I'm, I'm going to, you know, there's a brand out there that, that termed this stuff and they did a goddamn good job of marketing a broken snowboard. I can't do it. I, I grew up racing. I rode hard boots. Like, I like, I like to put some energy and have something come back. And that's just, I think I believe in it. Mm -hmm. I believe in that. That's, that's all that matters. Good answer. That's all that matters. All right. Uh, lastly, dude, you're a family man. What's going on? You got, you got some kids. I'm a family man. How is that? Yes. It's awesome. So it's, um, you know, funny stories that I met my wife, on those ride snowboard Euro trips years and years and years ago. And we were pen pals and it worked out and long distance phone calls from somebody else's phone. And um, so, yeah, got the, the lady over here. We ended up getting together and marrying each other. And um, she's from Europe, she's from Amsterdam. Right? Amsterdam. Den Haag, actually. Schaefening. The Dutch people will <laughs> like that. <laughs> Should we give her um, the super air horn? She needs super air horn. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so she was also a pro rider. She rode for Burton in Europe. Yep, she was a racer. So I was attracted. A woman like speed. <laughs> um, but no, <laughs> we, we, we got together and uh, it's been years, man. And we got two kids. I got a, a 16 year old son tomorrow. So he's 16 when you listen to this, and a 13 year old daughter. And, um, you know, I listened to Blue Montgomery's uh, bomb hole, and he had great parenting advice. And, I don't have parenting advice. <laughs> I, I, like I said, I just let shit happen. I be me and, and we do us and it's worked out really well. So, uh, yeah, my kids are awesome. Wesley and Fenna. Mm -hmm. Let's give them an air horn. Yep, they need double air horns right there. Well, they, they learned a lot if they listen to this from how to type a letter and 
look up an address and yeah. mail it to a sponsor with some pictures. Yeah, that's amazing. Sending to, in a letter to, to get sponsored. A, yeah, with to some be in photos a ride, that your yeah. dad took. Super yeah. pro to now working in the industry. Yeah, it's cool. And and I mean, you know, you just with kids, it's like you want to give them all the opportunities that they deserve, but you also want to give them all the opportunities that you never had. So they might, you know, get a little bit over spoiled with certain things, which is fine, but you got to keep it in line and in check. And um, I'm from Wisconsin. I got smacked in the backside of the head a few times. So <laughs> we'll, we'll keep them in line and make it good. And, and they're great kids. So yeah, I'm super stoked to be a, a dad and, and watch them prosper and grow and become themselves, you know, without, without, attempting to mold it's let it go and watch and correct when it goes left get over here all right before we get out of here do you want to throw out some thank yous i will man and that's a tough one because there's you know a bazillion people that i should probably thank but obviously first and foremost is my mother um my father passed away many years ago now but both of those two had everything to do with where i'm at and it's it's awesome so thank you mom and then uh you know my family my wife and kids for supporting me and um, you know, it's, it's never an easy road. So the fact that we can, we can do that and get through it and know that we're not in an atypical lifestyle, shit's different. Um, so thank you very much, family and, um, all my friends and thank you guys to all my friends. <laughs> <laughs> so stoked you came on here. That's Barfly. Yeah. yeah no, Barfly. thank, thank you very Barfly much. Barfly reference. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. You guys. It was awesome. And I love what you guys do. Keep doing it. It's bitching. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, we really appreciate your contribution to snowboarding. You paved the way for what it is today. And I uh, can't thank you enough for coming on. And I want to say thank you to all of our listeners. We really appreciate you guys. And we'll have another podcast coming at you on Wednesday. Over and out from the bottom hole. <laughs>